Yes, but I was I was in Amazon. Is the camera working? Oh, yeah, it's about to. Welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us uh, for this conversation. We have a great day. You will cover the classical information that you want to be spoken by a student at Foundation. Good morning. My name is Kaidel Nicolas Lopez. I am a member of the Latino Family Council and have this honor. To be a part of this internship group to be the Central Foundation. I'm also uh, the director of policy, fund policy with the uh, organization of Virginia called the Community Fund Collaborative. And I also have uh, the honor of teaching uh, sustainable transportation at the University of Virginia. And today we are beginning the Latino Advocacy Week Law 2023. Um, the Latino Advocacy Week is happening in 2021. And it has the objective of Help uh, Latinos be more prepared and familiarize with the processes of advocating to uh, politicians and how to use capacity as a collective so that we can be more comfortable doing that advocate for our families, our communities, uh, and for our comunidad uh, in a way we are going to send as well. Today, we will showcase the release of the conservation uh, and climate policy topics. The head of the Council 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 of the be discussing the Council of the Council the Council of 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 the that are going to bring these uh, perspectives of the practice uh, in the ground, working with all the different elements of the uh, of the Council of the from land use to ocean water to climate crisis. So uh, we're going to start right now with uh, Jessica Rodriguez, who is a conservation program manager with the Connected Foundation, and she's going to give us a little bit of a brief of this policy topic. <laughs> I don't know where my comments are, but hopefully it doesn't be in the way. 
Um, I'll speak just really quickly about the conservation policy toolkit. Um, it is, I believe, our third or fourth of the April. Um, but I'm really excited to present a new campus and get into the possible changes that have come in it. Um, but what is the toolkit exactly? Um, so the toolkit was created to show the importance of present day environmental policies and working with communities by really elevating and prioritizing methanol equipment um, when it comes to different conservation measures. So the toolkit, uh, primary goal of it is again to bring these viewpoints into the forefront and make historic and iconic space. Um, so it really is a great way to again elevate these voices that more often the people aren't often heard um, and prioritize our perspectives and the way that these issues actually affect our community. Um, so how can this toolkit be used? Um, it can and should be used in a myriad of different ways um, by a myriad of different people. <laughs> Thank you, Evelyn. Um, so who can use it and how should we use it? Um, it can be used as a media piece for uh, different media pieces, interview opportunities, articles, elevating these issues. Um, it could be used as an educational resource for advocates who are looking to get more involved and familiarize with the different transformation issues um, that are out there that we want to talk about, which I'll dive into a little bit more soon. Um, and ultimately, it should be used as motivation, right? community oriented solutions for these different climate topics. Um, so, again, trying to elevate the community perspective when it comes to addressing these issues and how we should be working from the bottom in a lot of these ways. Because ultimately, Latino communities and other uh, strictly marginalized communities are at the forefront of the issues, and again, their voices have not been at the forefront. So, um, our goal is that this toolkit can be a way to bring us to the forefront of the conversation as well. So, what does the toolkit actually look like? Um, the toolkit is divided into four different chapters based on a few different foundational pillars. Uh, so, those pillars are protecting uh, and restoring healthy lands, waterways, and oceans, addressing the climate crisis, environmental justice and health, and nothing more than the chapter. Um, so each of these chapters includes a brief breakdown of the issue, what it is that we are talking about, some specific data around um, how these points are affecting the Latino community, how our community is affected by these, um, and what are Latino opinions and perspectives around these issues. Um, and lastly, each chapter includes different recommendations from standing access staff on how to reach our goals for each chapter. Um, with that, I will end, but I would encourage all of you to use this toolkit again as an educational resource, um, as a tool for advocacy, um, and again, you can use by anyone, whether you are an ally, someone who is looking to get more involved in these issues, um, or someone who is meeting with their representatives tomorrow on the hill and need some data to kind of back up their words. But um, I will try to speak to you and see the rest of it, how that our journalists do that. So I'll talk about the type of that. So, uh, no, I just want to say, as a person at work, we have policies that I will use when I have a day job. Uh, but could be a, a conservation could be that has the 100% of the focus in the Latino perspective, in the Latino impacts of uh, how the, all these conservation challenges that we face in our the country and the world, uh, the species, actually impacts the Latino community specifically uh, from, again, land use. Uh, ocean water, climate crisis, it's so helpful. In other situations, you would have to go to whatever documents major or the state governments are putting together. And perhaps they will most likely they will mention the Latin community, but will be a little bit of what they're talking about. You're going to have to do a lot of research to find sufficient information about the Latino uh, perception of the facts and how they engage with all these changes. And just have these two pieces a hundred percent. About the Latino community on the country is still helpful. So I'm very glad that we have been with the special foundation. Now, uh, I'll, I'll, uh, let's move to this uh, final session where we're going to hear the perspectives of the leaders in the ground, leaders from our uh, foundation, leadership networks, and how I'll learn about the work there. Today, we have the honor of having with us uh, Adriana Duval.
She's a trained marine archaeologist and professional science communicator who currently serves as the communications manager for the National Ocean Inspection Coalition. As a member of the Texas Foundation's Ocean Advisory Council, they are hope to impact, impact sorry, uh, the, the cultural uh, importance of protecting our rivers and oceans. Uh, however, protection has not only ecological benefits, but it furthers a positive human connection to our earth and to one another. Andriana is also a listening scholar with the Colcom Institute's uh, Cultural Heritage and Engineering Initiative. Uh, at the University of California, San Diego, who has most recently uh, appeared in the third channel's US adventure job series that's met before an archaeologist, uh, archaeological uh, expert. I definitely need to check that uh, right now. Uh, um, and we also have Pastor Delta uh, de Paz, uh, the Latino uh, Confrontation Medical Case. Delta de Paz uh, recognized the important role that faith leaders. Playing promotes environmental stewardship between our communities, integrates environmental awareness into the messages of the church, educating and inspiring uh, its congregation and community to take action for the environment. Stella encourages spending time in nature and advocates, uh, advocates for policies and initiatives that protect rural spaces and promote sustainable practice. Thank you, Stella. And uh, last. But not least, we have uh, Marcelo Gonz uh, Gonzalez, who's a, who is a climate change and international development communicator, working as a communications associate at Climate Nexus on building electrification, uh, on building electrification and the uh, transition. Before coming to Climate Nexus, Marcelo works in the United Nations Development Program in Peru. Overseeing communications and international partnerships and a gender based violence prevention project, as well as COVID-19 awareness and response initiatives. Yeah, he has also worked as a digital strategy fellow at the CISNEOS Hispanic Leadership Institutes and as a digital communications associate for the United Nations Association of the National Capital Area. So for the lead master degree in media and strategic communication from George Washington University and a master in journalism and communications from the Trinity Technology University. Born in uh, raised in Lima, he's passionate about music, photography, and you can find him most weekends at a concert in one of his cities <laughs> many <laughs> awesome. So with that, uh, I'm really excited to have a this conversation with uh, our families. I will start with a set of class, set of the past, uh, so that he can share a bit of his expertise with uh, with land use. Hola, muy buenos días. Gracias por estar acá. Thank you for being here today. Thank you all of you who are watching online. Thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate it. Uh, probably just me. You can only five minutes. So it's my fingers crossed. That's it. <laughs> you can go all over. I'm a pastor. So I go way over. <laughs> <laughs> Today, I want to talk to you about an issue that affects all of us, regardless of our ethnicity, background, or beliefs. I'm here to discuss how we can work together to protect and preserve our environment and to ensure that all our communities have access to green spaces and the benefits that they provide. So, you may know the Hispanic Access Foundation is committed to improving the lives of Latinos throughout the United States. Uh, that includes promoting good physical health, a healthy natural environment, and civic in our communities. And during this week, the Latino Advocacy Week, we're hosting events that include discussions about how access to nature is crucial, is a crucial issue that affects our Latino communities in many ways. As you probably know, Latinos have a strong connection to the natural world. The cultures place a high value on relationships with the environment. And that relationship has shaped our identity and our way of life. In fact, Latinos have a big connection to nature. Let's say um, some of them, they, they, they do it through growing their own fruits and vegetables in gardens, but also passing down knowledge and herbal medicine. Many Latino communities have a strong tradition of using natural remedies and herbal medicines to treat common ailments. Uh, when I was writing this down, I remember we all probably have that abuelita or tia 
that every time that you're sick, we know it's going to give you, right? They mix this couple of leaves with a drop of honey and hot water, and that will give you the energy that you have. But that's true. Our knowledge of plants and their healing programs is passed down generations. These practices reflect our respect for the environment and cultural heritage. However, too often that relationship is threatened by pollution, climate change, and lack of access to green spaces. Research shows that access to nature is essential for our physical and mental well-being. It helps reduce stress, improve our immune system, but also even boost academic performances. Yet many Latino communities lack access to green spaces, which puts their health and well-being at risk. For instance, many Latino communities are located near sources of pollution, such as highways, factories, and that can make it difficult to enjoy, to make our communities enjoy outdoor spaces and really harm their health. Additionally, many Latino neighborhoods are characterized by limited resources and high levels of poverty, which can make it challenging to invest in parks and green spaces. This lack of access to nature can contribute to the health disparities and be responsible for social and economic inequality for Latino communities. Children and youth are especially vulnerable to the negative effects of a lack of access to nature. But it's actually that children who have access to green spaces are more physically active, um, they have better mental health, and are more likely to succeed academically. Unfortunately, many Latino children and youth uh, do not have access to these resources, which can have a lasting impact on their health and well being. That's why we must advocate for policies that protect our environment and expand access to green spaces, especially in low income communities and underserved communities. We can, some of the things that we can do uh, could be like support initiatives that provide funding for the creation of green spaces, parks, maintenance parks, community gardens. But also, we need to advocate for policies that protect our natural environment, our natural resources, like water, air, and soil. Expanding access to green spaces can also have some benefits, economic benefits for our communities. If you think about it, uh, let's just say community gardens can provide fresh produce, but also create local jobs. And if we invest in our communities, creating green spaces, that also we put money and invest in, let's say, parks that can also uh, <clears throat> increase, can attract tourists and increase property values in surrounding areas. So protecting our natural resources can create a sustainable future for our communities and ensure that our children and grandchildren can have the access to the same resources that we enjoy today. In addition to advocating for policies that protect our environment, it is important to recognize the significance of our national parks in preserving our country's natural wonders and cultural heritage. National parks not only provide opportunity for outdoor recreation and education, but they also play a critical role in conservation efforts. They protect wildlife, ecosystems, and historic sites, ensuring that future generations can experience and appreciate the natural beauty of our country. As a community, we're called to be good stewards of the earth and protect God's creation. And as advocates of Latino communities, we have a unique opportunity to work towards environmental justice and protect the health and well-being of our communities. So I urge you all to join us in advocating for policies that protect our environment and expand access to green spaces. Let us work together to ensure that all communities including our Latino children and youth have access to the benefits of nature and that we live a healthy and sustainable world for future generations. So, muchísimas gracias. Y ahora en español. For your inspiring and more constructive work, I think a lot of what you remember and a teacher that once told me that uh, religion means to be connected to the guys from the Latin. And we are really trying to reconnect the Latin and be the small earth that we were all connected at one. So, thank you for your work. 
moving forward, we're going to see how all the fish can be under the island as well. We're going to get a little bit of very experience in the ocean, we're going to get a virus. So, I think we're going to get a little Thank you. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, I'm really excited to be here, and I was so honored to have been asked to join this panel of really amazing conversationists in the house of it. Um, I have been a part of this many access since um, I started working on their Open Advisory Council in 2020, and we are now moving on with the model. Um, but I have really enjoyed working with incredibly inspiring and activating individuals who are so passionate about conserving our oceans and our waterways. And I've learned so much from them. Um, from my introduction, I'm sure you've heard I'm a marine archaeologist. Very different than anything in the science field in terms of you know uh, conservation and marine biology. So it's been a huge learning process for me, but if anything it's shown that having different perspectives perspectives in the conservation space is incredibly helpful, beneficial. And um, yeah, I just love to speak a little bit today about my experience, how I got into this, and what we can do as advocates to uh, progress some of these policies and to really benefit all the communities, including the West Indian communities. Uh, so I want to begin by discussing a little bit of how these conservation uh, policies and uh, these initiatives can really benefit culturally significant sites. So as again, as an archaeologist, my perspective, and through my lens, I see these cultural sites being incredibly at risk. We know that ocean acidification and sea level temperature rises are degrading these sites at alarming rates. And that's really pretty sad. And it's also scary because these sites are really important. They can be whether it's a shipwreck site or it's the coastal communities that have these really important cultural sites, they're disappearing. And we don't have them much longer. So, you know, it goes beyond of course, you know, we, we are trying to protect biodiversity, we're trying to protect um, healthy ocean ecosystems, but there's this cultural aspect as well. Um, and I really love to see I think that conversation come up a little bit more. And I know it's something that we probably need to talk about longer. Um, furthermore, we're seeing strengthening storm systems. I know in Florida, we're getting Crazy storms down there. And uh, I personally worked on some shipwreck sites that have been completely destroyed to not occur. And <laughs> those are um, sites that we're never going to get back the same way again. Um, you know, in archaeology, we've actually shifted in recent decades to a more in situ preservation model, which just essentially means that we're keeping the materials where we found them. It helps us to go back and actually research it further, but also um, it's one of the best preservation methods, but that's becoming, uh, that's just not able anymore. It's, or it's, the site is just being destroyed. So in, in my field, uh, my training as an archeologist, I can really see the intersection between these conservation conversations and the work of the archeologist. And again, I'm still quite new to the conservation phase and learning as much as I have from my colleague on uh, the Ocean Advisory Temple. Um, I will speak on a couple of topics, but I'm going to give them all the credit for all this information because I've learned everything from them um, and a little bit of my work at the National Ocean Protection Coalition, which we really um, have a learning protected area. So um, and that's actually what I want to talk a little bit about is specifically, you know, we, we talked about accessibility. Um, you know, I think a, a big kind of buzzword sentence is equitable access to nature. We want all communities to have the same access to nature that they deserve, especially uh, citizens here in the U.S. That is you know, part of the Constitution, you know. Um, and we know that time in nature is incredibly healing, both physically as well as mentally. And we know also through many studies and uh, through uh, reports that BIPOC communities just do not have the same access to nature. So what do we do? What is solutions? Well, one of the first ones is designating and act, uh, advocating for more marine protected areas, marine protected areas, or just areas of the ocean, uh, some are inland water areas as well that our, that our government has um, just prohibited a little bit of human activity in, in certain degrees. Um, and this actually leads to uh, better biodiversity in the area. It's also been documented, it shows spillover effects. 
So, which just means healthier, uh, more abundant marine life in the area, which actually then spills over into adjacent waters and the uh, benefits of fishermen in the area, which then benefit the communities. Um, and then, of course, these marine protected areas are also areas of education and research, and it does increase access to nature for really all communities. Um, so that's one solution is a marine protected area. Another is to create jobs and conservation. Uh, it's, it's always been a very white dominated field. It's something that uh, a lot of our communities have always been incredibly passionate about and, and care about, but we really lack that leadership or we do not really see the BIPOC leadership that we deserve to see who can advocate for our communities. Um, so by federally investing in some of these cultural uh, restoration uh, projects and creating those jobs and conservation, that creates more access to nature. It also uh, facilitates more um, of that pride in your in your community and, and protecting nature. And that's really important. Sometimes we get a little, you know, it, it, we feel a little hopeless. Like what, what else can we do? It's, getting that leadership, getting that support, and having those allies. And then finally, you know, we have storm and climate resilience. So we talk about mitigating the effects of climate change, but we also need to be very resilient because it's, it's, it's happening. Um, we're hoping less in it, but in the meantime, let's try to make our communities more resilient to these effects. Um, so we have, again, this is something that I have been taught from my colleagues, but we talk about green and gray infrastructure. And you know, uh, water management systems, whether that's uh, let's create uh, and, and protect more the wetlands or, or floodplain areas, or even gray infrastructure, which is more um, typical types of water management. Those places, uh, those those things that we can put into place really help these communities have clean, safe drinking waters, um, clean air, and greater access to nature. And it really is a kind of a simple solution. It's, it's tough to get there, but we know what to do. We know what to do. And, and I'll say that, you know, a common misconception that I've had, uh, that I held before getting involved with Hispanic access, before being a part of uh, the Ocean Side Bridge Council, was that I didn't know what to do. I knew I wanted to do something, but I had no idea how to start. I didn't know how to engage the government. It was scary. It was confusing. Um, I felt it was beyond me, and that no way would my little voice and that is completely changed after being involved in Hispanic access. So, you know, it, it's organizations like Hispanic access that are setting the example of climate engagement and conservation advocacy. You're providing the tools that are easily digestible, that are accessible, um, and that provide a really clear roadmap for how to engage and to. So, um, if I can end this note on anything, it's uh, to, well, first, Look for something in your local community. I really believe that's where it starts. So sort of uh, initiative, some sort of campaign that calls to your heart. And you know, it can be any, it can be people, animals, land, water, whatever it is. Get involved with your local community. Just volunteer, get involved, learn more. Then reach out to organizations that you trust, like Hispanic Access, or any of the organizations that you do trust and that you have engaged with previously. And get those, uh, get those resources that they have so readily available, like the toolkit that we're using today. Use it and then engage and do any little thing because that's so changing. Um, and that's how mountains are moved. That's it. Again, uh, making a connection between our uh, digital roles and how we start the global level and we're trying to see how uh, all of these, your project first in my that I've had in my life. It's such a uh, complex science that we uh, you're connecting to your things that matter for us in our daily lives, which is really important for words. Uh, now we're going to, oh, by the way, since you mentioned the toolkit, I should say, uh, whoever has the, the bag of experience explanation uh, shared with uh, you all today, uh, there is a, uh, you can't hear me? Sorry. Uh, oh, oh. Is this better? Oh, my. Okay. So uh, there is a, a little paper with a QR code that's going to allow you to quickly download the toolkit. So, over it. Uh,
Uh, now, uh, again, uh, as well as these, we're going to go over to uh, my second side. Is who uh, I'm handing off the mic so that you can share with me the next revision. I'm right. Thank you, my side. Hi. Half the time myself, so I hope that I go over. But uh, hi, everyone. It's just a real honor to be here uh, with you all today on the panelists and with all the people I'm not very excited about this. Um, as someone who's worked in uh, and who's dedicated to communicating about climate change and our international development, I've always been passionate about conservation and climate action, um, especially in the face of these unprecedented, and I feel like that's not really important, but it is unprecedented um, climate change, human caused. Uh, disasters in the last few years. According to NOAA, in 2022, there were 18 multi billion dollar disasters happening, all in the US, from the rest of the world. And these affect millions of Americans, you know, just millions of Americans. The climate crisis is more than just an environmental issue, it's a human rights issue, it's a threat of health, for democracy, for our economy, for security, and for culture. And this is why I believe that it's, it's so important for us to act urgently and collectively in the face of all of these um, things. It's given only some opportunity to act. You've probably heard already, and you maybe hear it about this, uh, Latinos are uh, more likely to face these events of climate change, um, according to the EPA, Latinos are more likely than others. Twice to uh, be affected by things like droughts, floods, extreme heat, um, hurricanes, and many other disasters uh, that again plague the US every year. And uh, this is why uh, I think we need to again tackle these challenges. Many Latinos and Latinas and Latinx work in outdoor public education, such as agriculture, construction, and landscaping, and that exposes them to also dangerous heat levels. Latinos also tend to live in areas that are already to the effects of climate change, such as California, Texas, Florida. But beyond these really flashy headlines that we see all the time, I would like to bring our attention to another issue that I work in a public nexus, and that is the use of the so called natural gas. And yes, while this might not draw the attention of the headlines, I still think that it's a climate change issue. The fact that we use uh, fossil fuels in many of our homes and millions, millions of our homes every single day, and that again puts it farther away every single day from fixing this issue. And yes, it, you might not think that it's a big climate change issue, but in my area of work, we know that the impacts are there. We know that Latinos are more likely to live in multi generational households, households with more insulation, have more ventilation, that are not very good quality. That are more likely to inhale the fumes that come out of natural gas and to suffer the effects such as cancer, asthma, and other respiratory diseases. What are some solutions for this? Um, I think that you know, consider no use of the gas bill, but again, that's not really the individual action responsibility to what we help. We need to have policy and collective action for this to actually work, uh, like electric fire buildings. I think clean energy is a great solution and they help alleviate, not solve, but alleviate any of these problems. And not for us with the revenue of school and diverse workers. It is essential for policymakers to take all of this into account when making decisions about our future and the future of our life. This is where initiatives like the Constitution of Soviet that we just announced come into play. I think with tools like these, uh, you and other advocates can learn how to get involved. How to target the decision makers at every level of government to get business to you and how to turn your ideas into very different policies and very real viable solutions. Thank you for your attention. One of the talks that need to be uh, addressed, and I applaud your reports uh, in these uh, very complex uh, area. So now we are uh, concluding these uh, panel sessions and we are going for a round of questions from the people in the room and or online. So uh, thanks so much for sharing all your knowledge. Let's move to Q&A. Thank you. 
Thank you, everybody, for your presentation. Um, Marcelo, I'm interested that you're saying like about gas stoves. So if it's not gas stoves, like what are you like advocating for? Like what is the solution? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, so repeat the question. Yeah, okay. So the, the question was, okay, so gas stoves are a problem. What is the solution? And that is, I mean, I spent all day with right? <laughs> So uh, one solution, and again, we have to think about this not only as individual action, but also a collective policy, because we understand that not everyone, I would say that most people don't have the capacity to just buy a new kit, right? <laughs> like retrofit completely very late in our house to stop using gas, that's not really an option. In my lab, uh, we like to look at specific, specific actions like buying an induction stovetop. Induction is a new technology, well, new ish technology that it is, uh, well, it's faster, it's easy to cook faster, it's cleaner, it's healthier, doesn't get identical to these gases. But I think, like I said, electric fine buildings at a statewide level or even at a city level is important because you cannot expect one person, one family. Stop using gas simply because they want to, right? Uh, there, there have been decades of use of, of the gas companies lobbying to get their lives put in to get all of the uh, all of the, these companies to get all this. And so we're going to need the government to step up and actually provide a voice. Thank you. Thank you. Right, so do you have another question? Or do you I have a follow up uh, to that question. Um, I work in clean energy and electrification is like, I guess, a big push. So, if we move from using gas to electrifying the grid, who, in your professional opinion, what happens to that industry, those workers, those people? Because we want to go clean, right? So, what happens to the people on the ground that need those jobs and might not have another avenue. All right, to summarize the question, uh, I think uh, the question will be just transition for the current workers of the natural gas uh, sector. So, what's your opinion of how this is happening? Thank you. And I, I, I didn't expect the panel to turn into that discussion. But this is, I am a I mean, this is my job, right? So, um, Again, I think we, we understand that, that there is a huge challenges in terms of like the changes, right? Um, and one of the challenges, again, is the workforce, right? How do you develop good union position jobs for the workers of tomorrow and the children of today that are going to be losing their jobs? I think, uh, well, the truth is that your energy is also moving. We have the IRA passed last week that has promised that it's including a lot of rebates to new uh, funding for these jobs. And with that comes training. This is why I think the solution is a little easier than a little, sorry, not easier, but harder than just buying and construction stuff. So you need to have government, private corporations, and the public in general interest in collaborating together to generate these jobs, to open up these pathways, to go for the developments, and to ensure that again, the decision doesn't leave anyone behind. You see a lot of new technology happening right now. Like, again, new ways to cook, new ways to keep your home. But not everyone can afford it. So how can we truly say that we're doing that just transition when only the riches of us will do that? We need to have a cohesive effort that everyone is switched. And in that, I also think it will be All right, I'm lobbying. I just want to point out all the other questions. So, yeah, uh, another question for you. This is a table. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I want to start off by thanking you for being here and I'm posing this to anyone who's um, willing to answer, especially uh, since this does seem to be a focus on communications among the three of you. I'm curious, like as leaders in your particular fields, what resources do you feel like are either currently lacking or what resources do you wish you had to better communicate to the public, particularly to that public? Perfect. So, uh, resources to better communicate uh, your areas of interest or work uh, to the community is wonderful first. Uh, one of the things that uh, information, and it's only getting straight for that. And I keep in mind that well, I'm a pastor. A lot of uh, Latinos don't know the process of uh, how to communicate with government. How do we do it? They actually, some of them are really afraid 
to those people and then ask the questions, but to advocate and have, have the resources basically. And how can we get the information, the steps, just let it go? The toolkit was amazing. Uh, it, it teaches us what to do and how we can uh, get involved in government and, and policy and, and decision making. That, that would be one of the yeah, I'll say from my perspective, working as the communications manager for MPC National Protection Coalition, you know, we work with a lot of BIPOC communities. Um, we focus a lot for, on Indigenous led campaigns and designations. Um, so I think, in terms of the resources that we would be lacking, um, it's just the, the cultural knowledge working with so many different types of cultures. And we specifically wanted to work with the Latino community, um, you know, having the language. As a barrier is a huge. I, I always say this question, but I say I'm a bad Latina because I don't speak Spanish. Um, but that's you know that's a big deal if I'm not able to uh, translate it in a way that's understandable and adjustable to them. Then the information is it's not useful. Um, and then knowing where to go. So you know we talked about uh, areas of faith, and then that's that's a huge, very powerful place that make people trust their faith leaders. So. Um, Resources would be, yeah, learning the community stuff. It's it's, it's hard for national organizations, um, and that's something that more funding groups would be able to do. Absolutely. Excellent. Uh, if I may, I'll just uh, like to add that there's a concept called procedural justice. So when we're talking about climate justice, social justice in general, procedural justice is how we are doing it, how we are doing it. With the new members of the community, etc., and et cetera, and how else could that just put it uh, into a variety of uh, channels, ways, uh, and languages is very important. So, thank you so much. Uh, one other question here. Okay, okay. thank you. Oh. <laughs> okay. Eh, un poco más que una pregunta es una concienciación. Eh, yo no, no sabía sobre la pasión que había dentro de mí hasta que alguien me informó. Entonces, eh, tuve la oportunidad de presentar a Hispanic Access Foundation en una reunión en Puerto Rico con personal del río, Departamento de Interior de Casa Blanca. So, yo no sabía qué era lo que yo podía tocar. Pero me puse a pensar que cuando yo era niña, al venir de una familia muy empobrecida, los únicos recursos para yo y divertirme, ¿verdad? poder desarrollarme sanamente, era la montaña, el río, las flores, eh, los árboles. Esos fueron mis juguetes. Y por eso crecí sana. Eso que mentalmente hablando. <risa> Así que cuando expongo ante ellos cómo la naturaleza me había permitido desarrollarme sanamente, se creó una conciencia que se unió a la pasión por una población. Por años he trabajado en la causa de las mujeres. Así que me puse a pensar que un país tan eh, marcado por traumas, eh, principalmente por efectos eh, ambientales, ¿no? este, como podría ser el huracán Irma María, luego viene el polvo de Sahara, luego llega entonces los temblores y finalmente la pandemia. Entonces, ¿cómo ayudar a mujeres en comunidad que estaban pasando por toda esta situación y necesitaban respirar? Necesitaban. Y entonces empecé a hacer proyectos en Puerto Rico y acercarlas a ellas, a la naturaleza, ver que los accesos de la naturaleza les ayudase a trabajar su salud mental, su estabilidad. El cortisol es muy peligroso en el cuerpo. Es el químico que produce ¿verdad? todo este estrés y daña porque se somatiza toda esa situación en el cuerpo. Pero la naturaleza como co-creación tiene una facultad increíble para permitir que ese efecto se aminore. Así que un poco es lo que ustedes han estado comentando. Y un poco es conectarse a Diana con una pasión con una población, con algo que haga cantar tu corazón, que te haga feliz y que tú harías, aunque estás muy cansado, lo seguirás haciendo hasta que te mueras, ¿no? Porque eso es tu, tu pasión. 
Así que es un poco eso, ¿no? De, de estar cada uno consciente de que dentro de todo este tema le apasiona, porque si usted está aquí, algún propósito debe haber, porque está escuchando esto. Antes que estuviera en charge, puso su nombre y. Sí, Pastor Mari Carmen Laureano de Puerto Rico. Sí, perfecto. Uh, Maybe I'm just thinking out loud. Pero, ¿cómo se llama? ¿Cómo se llama? Florencia. Florencia, gracias. Yo, yo vine a Estados Unidos. Eh, I'm struggling with my English. That's why I had to read my presentation. Pero cuando vine a Estados Unidos, mi meta era esperaba llegar a ser ciudadano. Y nunca, nunca vine pensando en estar en una posición en donde yo podía generar un cambio. I can never thought I could be in a position where I could lead change. Es a, a los latinos, como Costa Rica. Vengo de Costa Rica. Entonces, como organización de la like Hispanic Access Foundation, uh, gives us a message that say that you can do, you have a voice, you can make a change. Porque muchos en mi comunidad hispana dicen que yo vengo aquí a lo que el gobierno me diga. Porque ¿quién soy yo para, para generar un cambio? Yeah, I'm just thinking about it. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Pero qué, qué importantes organizaciones como, como estas que nos ayudan, nos ayudan a, a ver las cosas de una manera diferente. Y si me ayudan, pues. Yeah, I hope you all are getting this most. I think we I say, this one's like all about sharing your story and uh, inspiration as well. She was such a beautiful about uh, the environment and uh, what's better for her mental life when you have on today. So, make a bridge. You want to be one of the other involved in mental health related to the work that you're doing or even mental health. I think you want to turn more So my concern is that I see that there's a lack of leadership in the representation uh, world with representation of Latinx and other underserved communities. I see how communities of color are not being part of education because they don't own their houses. They don't have the money to make the changes. And yeah, there are rebates from government, but we know that our communities are completely underserved and not really a part of this process. Another problem that I see is that when they switch to electricity, they are in areas that are more propensed to power averages, so they don't know how to cook. They don't have a way to cook because they lose power all the time. So my question for you is, if you see a young person trying to make change in that area, what would be a good career for them to be part of that change? Because I see a lot of biologists and conservation, youth are going to work those careers and that's wonderful. But we also need representation for transportation, electrification, and other areas where our communities are completely underserved. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Alejandra. Uh, okay, so career advice for who is wanting to engage with uh, natural gas education. Uh, career advice. I need to that. So, <laughs> thank you for your question. I, and then you're, you're totally right. I think electrification, in my opinion, at least at a, at a federal and national level, is still a great place. It has a lot of the leaders and a lot of the, the, the the thought uh, makers and in this favor. So why and don't really take into account uh, many of the specific disadvantages and any others in this country. Um, the career advice for someone who's trying to make this change, I've seen incredible projects at a local level do work. Because really, and again, I, I did say that you need this change to have it happen because it cannot be individual. But at least at a local level, there are some great examples we're working right now with Bush, uh, Buffalo with this uh, a group in the north the western New York that they do uh, these projects trying to change a few issues those for a few families in uh projects. and it works because then they see less missions they cook better they have less health problems and you didn't change the lives of a million people you changed the lives of 10 families but these 10 families now can uh you know not 
being beholden to uh, the gas industry. And I think that if somebody wants to go into this industry, wants to tackle this issue, going local is great and we can use these pilot examples to uh, have these plans designed at the state and at the national level. Another really great example would be Casa uh, Pueblo in Puerto Rico. I met them uh, when we were on a trip with a friend of mine a few months ago, and I met uh, working there, and they just, I think, in March, uh, a couple of weeks ago, they, they uh, released their first uh, community solar project in uh, at Bumfest, and they installed their battery. They brought their battery from, like, I think, Miami or something, and, and they, they installed it themselves. And I think that is a, a great example of how collective action can have real world impact. And again, yes, I mentioned the IRA, but you don't need that for a lot of reasons. You only need some people who are passionate about it and who are willing to uh, put in the work to make this happen. Excellent. Uh, I'll like to complement a little bit uh, by saying that because I think uh, those international local governments being a very important uh, way of meeting with that. But the decision about much less than some time makes a lot of utilities. And sometimes the local government uh, government owns the amount of gas utilities sometimes, or they actually manage the policy regarding it. So we engage at the local community level when it comes to natural gas and create a transition. Really important. Uh, we, have, we have a question there. Uh, okay, so we'll be here uh, again before that. You can. <laughs> 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 um, my question is on, um, so you're talking a little bit about kind of like local power, right? And so um, I guess the question is what is my answer is like, what is the role of local government, right? Given that uh, we can just like, Federal government is having to step in to create these stores um, that, that are impacted for the local um, revenue stream. Yeah, just like what, what is what is the role of the, of the local government when um, Latinos are already on board, right? And you know, maybe there's other, there, there needs to be that push from other interested other interested. Think from what was the knowledge I have. <laughs> Uh, it, it's voting in your representation. So that's to me where it starts. And obviously that's a, that's a tough road to traverse, but um, once you get representation within your local government, whether that's city council or you know, at least the mayor that's on board with a lot of those priorities for the local community, um, that's one of those changes in starting. Uh, so that'd be my example. The local government can be a, a connector of sorts. Uh, they can connect, they can draw interest from private corporations, for instance, this kind of way. They can be the connector of local communities. They can get their voice. Once you vote, or are actually interested working for this, you can have these governments advocate for their own issues at a small scale. But then again, you talk about the federal government, then bringing it up. Uh, but local government can ask the government to. Right, like it's, it's sort of like a favorite platform to ask for it, like the analysis. And so, yeah, I see them as, as a connector of sorts, as someone who can actually uh, voice the people's Okay, So, we have uh, another question there. Thank you. Gracias. Buenos días. Mi nombre es Carolina Peña. Y estoy muy emocionada de haber estado a lo último y en las preguntas. Eh, bueno, soy la gerente del programa y comadre del programa Moms Clean Air Force y estoy muy orgullosa de poder escuchar la señora en español en mi idioma. And also in English, because I know that there are some Latinos here in the US that speak English. So I just want to say that our work in Ecomadres is to provide exactly bilingual information, how to go to vote. Actually, last year we started a campaign of getting our voice because our voice is our power and how we can be represented in the Congress because the people that are in the Congress have to represent the priorities and what our values are. And at the end of the day, what we want is to improve the health of our community. And unfortunately, as uh, Marcelo was saying at the end, uh, our communities are the ones that are either living or working. Our kids are playing in places that are polluted. 
And even worse is that sometimes they don't know because there are pollution that you cannot see it, but it's there and it's affecting our health. So I just want to say, like when they were saying the question, like uh, what information is available? I just want to invite them the great work that the Hispanic Actors Foundation, and I'm very proud that I am part of this year um, conference, is that we want to align our efforts, our work, and our passion of how we can make accessible information in both languages in a way that is understandable, because sometimes climate change and pollution could be overwhelming. And one of the reasons that actually I started working with the Comadres is because I wanted to be part of my community and how I could help us to thrive. And uh, I just become citizen last year and I was very excited in order for me to express my vote because sometimes people that think now that our vote is something that is powerful. So, so what that was our campaigning go to vote with my with my colleagues, like how we can get others to be motivated to act. So so I just I can take hours to talk. I know that we have limited some time, but I just want to say that I really invite you to, to also uh, follow us. And we are very excited to be part of this community here in the US. I work a lot in Latin America in my previous jobs. So, so I am very uh, excited to be working here with Latinos in the US. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I can share that uh, exciting. I just want to say that uh, I will talk with two main topics uh, in the Q and more or less. Uh, not sure ask me one of the things that a little bit. And well, one has to do with uh, communication, experiences with the Latin community receiving and uh, their input as well. And uh, I want to share uh, a couple of things that I cannot avoid saying. Um, but well, first part of that some of you space especially with newly integrated people in the public. The second that I observe, which is not so obvious for me, is their concern of exposing themselves in public places in their communities, especially those that do not need to culturally engage with the science of data. And you imagine go to a city council or a city or county to speak uh, demanding something. And also from the position of feeling grateful, both of us being friends, feel grateful for having the opportunity to be in your country. Um, from the public places, you actually can demand for more, you actually can ask for more. And they feel like, you know, I just have to be grateful that I'm here, whatever. So uh, just having these uh, environments where we are engaging with each other and empowering each other to actually yeah. feel comfortable, actually. understanding that our voice matter, um, we can ask for more and we can't be uh, It's so great. I and mean, it's interesting that we have um yeah we definitely do i wanted to read a comment in the chat yeah. um it's not a question but it says collaborating at a local level with education in the trades and other community focused groups um so i think that was a response to one of the questions around resources um from susan clark uh so i just wanted to mention that and then briefly i also wanted to um before we end, if you all could share how folks can get in touch with you to con continue the conversation. But um, yeah, feel free. Sure. Um, you can email me. My last name, Dowell. D O W E L L, first name, Andriana, A N D R I J N N A, at gmail.com. That would be the easiest way to communicate with me. Or you can follow um, or engage with the organization I work with, National Ocean Protection Coalition. Do a lot of great work, a lot of uh, icons and engagement led uh, by the initiatives. Yeah. So, but... I'm Fabianessis. Uh, this is Twitter, uh, Facebook. So, uh, you can find me on LinkedIn, uh, on Instagram, uh, and if you want my involvement. I'll put it out here. Same. Yeah, so mine would be my uh, Pastor César de Paz and Gmail. Oh. Pastor César de Paz. Okay. Well, we weren't on the presentation. <laughs> so, my, uh, 
Rose will like to be as well. I don't think it's going to go away on economic clauses or community funding for others on 12 4. The climate clause is for us to be able. Thank you so much for being here today with us. Reporting as well, I will see you for those who are here and alive. I just hope you can pass the minority and we'll see us together in these amazing. Thank you so much. And see you next year, I guess.